Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. Today's guest is Ben Parker, owner and operator of Parker's Outfitting. This is Scott Williams, your host of Real Foot Forward, where every single week we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in beautiful West Tennessee. Today, I've got um, a really special guest with me who's going to help answer a lot of questions about duck hunting that I have always wondered. We have Ben Parker here with Ben Parker Outfitting. Welcome, Ben. Glad to be here. How are you? I'm fantastic. So I can tell by looking at the at the uh, video that I get to see that that you are in some kind of a lodge or a place where hunting happens. Where are uh, you right now? I'm at my lakeside lodge, which is in Sandburg, Tennessee. It's right on the the shoreline of Real Foot Lake. Um, I've got a, a house here, and I've got a building out back with a big. Uh, inside garage that we, it was kind of my summertime project actually this year. I converted a garage into a cool area with a, a table and chairs, uh, enough to seat about 20 people. And uh, it's a great place to do a Zoom from, evidently. It works. It works anyway, which is good. Um, so take me all the way back to the beginning. I know your grandfather, Elmer Parker, was a big influence on you and, and, and hunting. Tell me a little bit about your past. I'm curious how you know Elmer Parker, who told you about my grandfather. I do my research. I, evidently so. That, that caught me off guard. I didn't realize you'd be asking about him right off the get-go. No, he was, man, growing up, he was my best buddy. Um, I spent a lot of my childhood and um, especially in the summer times and when I wasn't in school and on the weekends. Uh, my grandfather, he didn't live right here where my lakeside lodge is. They had another house on around on Lake Drive. And when I was little, uh, I stayed there with uh, him and my grandmother. And uh, just, you know, he taught me how to uh, fish, how to hunt. My, my father did every chance he could as well. Uh, but uh, I spent a lot of summer days with my grandfather out on the lake, and that's where I really got hooked uh, uh, in the outdoor world, I guess you could say. Um, and you were, where were you living at the time? Where did you grow up? Well, um, in Obine County, uh, we, growing through the years, uh, we had moved, you know, uh, to, we lived in two or three places along Highway 22. And then when I was in high school, we lived uh, uh, just inside Union City. But I went to the uh, Obion County Central High School and graduated from there um, and lived in Reeves for a short period of time. But, you know, in Obion County my whole life. And you hunted the whole, whole all your childhood, teen years, Yeah, I college. mean, you know, I, it's a hunting family. All the, all the guys in my family um, uh, like to hunt and fish. And it was just what we do. Um, so you're gonna you're gonna be uh, the perfect person to answer some of these questions um, because I um, don't know a ton about duck hunting, even though we live so close to Real Foot Lake, mm -hmm. um, and I, I I'm really curious. So, um, but before we jump into that, um, you have an interesting background in that you um, you didn't major in hunting. Tell me a little bit about uh, what what you chose to go into during college. Well, I. I graduated high school and I was fortunate enough to get um, an emerging leader scholarship at the University of Memphis, which actually paid for my entire school, um, you know, tuition the whole time I was in school in Memphis. And I lived there for five years. Um, of course, I worked in restaurants and on campus and all kinds of stuff because I had to pay for where I was staying. But I was fortunate to have my college paid for. Uh, but when I got out, um, I had a degree in, in business real estate finance. Uh, so I, the last bit of my senior year was kind of focused a lot on real estate type classes. Um, I was one of those guys in college that I changed my major like three or four times. I was just very, and you know, just I couldn't make up my mind. And going forward, what I tell people now, and I'll tell you is, if you don't know what you want to major in, just get a degree in business anything. 
because even if you don't go the business route, you still learn a lot about how to run your household and how to, you know, take out a loan or, and, and a lot about finances. So I think, I think there was a lot of life lessons learned from, from that type major because it's stuff that you're going to de- you deal with uh, as an adult, you know, uh, the rest of your life. But um, when I graduated from there, um, I actually went, uh, had a job with Edward Jones for a year. I was an investment broker. Um, and then I moved back to Union City and worked for First Citizens um, in a brokerage office there for about four years. And then I worked for uh, Ken Fisher out in Northern California for almost three years. So that was, you know, I got out of college in 2000 and I got out of the investment business, you know, in that two, at the end of 2008, which happened to be a good time to get out, I guess you could say. Um, and just did a 180, um, career wise and said, you know what, I've, I, I've been in sales now for, you know, eight, nine years. And I realized how much work it takes to make it a dollar and woke up one morning and said, you know, I'm satisfied with how much money I'm making, but I'm miserable and I don't want to go to work in the morning. And it was all because I wasn't selling what I was passionate about. And then the day I realized that, I quit my job with no plan at all. And I had a boat and I said, I'm going to start bass fishing professionally. And I got a boat and I had just enough money to, to get me through a few tournaments. And within two years, I had climbed actually too fast to the uh, Bassmaster Elite Series uh, I didn't know how that worked at all, but it's not the money making <laughs> job that you would think touring and fishing uh, professionally. Did you get like corporate sponsors, that kind of thing? Well, you try to, you know, um, I had a company pay me $10,000 worth of crankbaits one year to promote them. Well, I can't pay my electric bill with crankbaits. I mean, I like fishing lures, but you know, it's, getting it all to work out right. It's really what I learned was, if you're going to get in the bass fishing world and fish it professionally, you better have enough money or enough backing when you start to sustain you for about five years. Mm. And if you get about five years in the business and a lot of people take notice that you're still in the business. And then I think it's, you pick up and things get a lot easier. The only way it goes works well uh, starting out is if you just start out hot and you win a couple of really big tournaments uh, in the beginning, but man, that's, that's really hard to do. You're fishing against the hundred best people in the country and they've already fished that lake. You've never been to 15 times before you get there. So it's really hard to come out hot, not say, you know, some guys have had some success doing that and, and are still in the business. But when I got into the fishing business, I really didn't have anything to do in the winter. And back when I was in college in Memphis, uh, I had, you know, started my own duck guiding business. My grandfather, my father helped me out with that, helping me find customers to take. And by the time I graduated college, I had a full blown waterfowl guide business. And I just stopped doing that, you know, when I got in the investment world. But I I thought, you know what, I think I'm going to start guiding again back on real foot. So I started that business up uh, the same time I started bass fishing professionally because, you know, duck season's happening during the winter. I ended up buying a house from my father that that's a house has been in our family since my grandfather built it in 1957. Uh, the house next door, his mother built in the forties. So we're right here on the property that we've had for a long time um, today. But when I got, you know, started fishing and I started getting in the hunting side, the hunting side and the real estate side seemed to be a more profitable way to, to get a consistent business. Bass fishing seemed more, like you were going to the casino. It was a lot more gambling. I needed something a little bit stable. And maybe one of these days I'll get back on the bass fishing trail. But right now, really for the last 10 years, I've done nothing but focus on uh, waterfowl business. As And that's led to a lot of other things. I've, I've got a couple properties that I rent all year round at the lake now. Um, and I use those as hunting lodges during the winter time, but I have families all the time from Memphis and Nashville that bring families and stay at real foot Lake and they come visit you guys at the discovery park. So that's, um, and especially this year, you know, with 
how COVID was at the beginning of the spring, you know, I had about eight weeks of my busy springtime season cancel. Mm. But the good thing was later in the summer and early fall, I had a much more, uh, it was busier than normal. It was like every weekend I had both my houses, but it was a lot of people that didn't want to travel to the beach. It was people that maybe drove from Chicago to here or, uh, you know, drove within, you know, four or five hours. So we get a lot of more local traffic, I guess you would say, since uh, COVID, which has been nice because if you want to come and quarantine yourself from the world, you can come down and stay at a place on Real Foot Lake and you pack your groceries. You don't have to go anywhere and enjoy the lake. It's absolutely beautiful out here. Well, so that makes me wonder, like, who is in a non-pandemic uh, time. Who's your like typical average client? Like who hires you to take them duck hunting typically? On a well, you can divide that in two categories probably. Um, one category is are just you know family and friend groups that that may not they may travel all together to come here, um, or they may come from different parts of the country to come here. Um, because they're friends, they're old college buddies, they're related, you know, that's probably about half the business. And my other half of my business now is really corporate stuff. So um, you could have a company come in and they bring, uh, you know, the owner of the company comes, he brings his two best sales reps and they bring their two best customers each. And they have uh, a captive audience, I guess you could say, for you know a couple of days staying here and 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 staying in a house uh, and a lodge together and hunting together and eating together, and it's just a great way to uh, to to spend the day, uh, you know, outside doing something fun in the outdoors. Very often, have people come who um, are not um, experts in duck hunting. You know, do you introduce the sport? We do have quite a few kids and we do have, uh, you know, guys call all the time. Hey, Ben, you know, we're big uh, uh, whitetail hunters, but we've never gotten into waterfowl hunting. We don't know anything. And and if that, and we get calls like that. And if that's, um, you know, if you want to get into waterfowl hunting for the first time and you need to know the best thing to do is to tell me that on the front end, because I can walk you through everything that you need to bring and all the stuff you can leave at home. Well, and I'm glad you said that because that was going to be my next question. So let's say I called you up and I wanted you to introduce me um, to waterfowl hunting. What? Tell me a little bit about what we would do and, and how you would go through that. Well, the coolest part of everything is what the birds are doing and, and being a part of watching the wildlife migrate. Uh, as they do every winter. Uh, you got to understand some of these birds that we see are, are, are actually bred in Canada and in northern parts of Canada and, and even Alaska, uh, way, way north of here. And this, there are different seasons depending geographically where you are. So uh, a lot, when people from the United States call and say we want to go on a hunt, their hunt, they know for the most part, they're hunting the Mississippi River Flyway. There are several flyways that run you know, pretty much north and south that are uh, across the United States, but the flyway that we're on is the Mississippi River. So ducks that breed in Canada and start coming south, they're really following the Mississippi River and they use these rivers and tributaries and creeks even and old sloughs as highways and as navigation ways as they travel south. So where we are in northwest Tennessee, I tell folks uh, that we're about halfway north-south of the Mississippi River Flyway, and West Tennessee and the Boot Hill, Missouri, almost act as a pinch point in the flyway, where you have a large funnel up above us of birds coming that all from the Dakotas and, and from Minnesota and, and from Michigan, and they all kind of funnel back down the Mississippi River and they bottleneck right here and, and you know, from West Tennessee to the uh, Boot Hill, Missouri. And then it kind of opens back up and it encompasses, you know, pretty much almost all of Arkansas uh, and Louisiana and Mississippi, um, all the way down, you know, to the Gulf of Mexico. So, 
the cool thing about the migration here is that when it gets cold, like right now, I, I was on the lake this morning and saw all kinds of ducks. Uh, it was cool this morning. Yesterday it was hot. You could tell a front come through. Uh, I got chilly. I was not prepared this morning. I was on the lake about 530 this morning um, and it was chilly. So when the north wind blows, it, it, these birds get up and it just, they just ride the wind and they, these fronts push them down. And when it, and if it stays too cold, all the migration comes on through us and goes on south. And then when it warms up, you see this migration of birds comes all the way back up the river. And you see everything that goes with it. Yeah, we like to shoot waterfowl because I, I love to eat them. And, and uh, the challenge is trying to trick the bird to come in and using a duck collar to do it. And knowing where the birds have come from and, and being able to uh, – uh, watch the migration and, and all the birds that come along with them like bald eagles. I mean, the bald eagle migration completely co coincides with waterfowl. So uh, the more waterfowl we have, the more eagles we have because those eagles, a lot of them have come from Canada and they feed on the ducks as well. So they're, they're hunting ducks just like we are. Um, so it's just beautiful to see and it's fun to try to trick a duck. So if I uh, was going to come and you were going to take me hunting, uh, what, what do I need to pack with me and what do I need to leave at home? Well, um, Real Foot Lake is, has its own tradition that is not like everywhere else. So let me give you some examples. Um, I've hunted in Canada before and a lot of times when you hunt up there for ducks or geese, you, you use a layout blind. So you, it's like a sleeping bag that you, you, that you veg up or you camo up on the ground and you get inside it and you lay on your back and you throw out some decoys and you hunt for a little while. And then you've got different kind of hunts like in Arkansas, there might be flooded, uh, an oak, you know, a forest with oak trees and it's flooded and people are wearing chest waders and you're standing waist deep water um, and hunting that way. Uh, you could be in uh, a rice pit, which is like a little metal tank that they put in the ground and it's in these little ridges that run across these rice fields. And so your eyeball level with the water in front of you um, and, you know, just like a little dugout area. And then you've got Real Foot Lake, which is more along the lines of a lot of the way that a lot of private individuals have duck blinds. We have them out on Real Foot Lake where... Um, we take, you know, we leave the lodge by boat and a lot of times and go from the boat to the duck blind and get out of the boat into the duck blind. So it's comfortable. You don't have to have waders because you're never going to be in the water. You're not going to be in the mud. Um, so a lot of people are kind of confused with, we don't have to bring boots. I'm like, no, if it's nice outside, you can wear tennis shoes or house slippers or whatever you want to wear, uh, just wear warm clothes and, and camouflage clothing. Because when you get there, you know, it might be a cold ride on the way. So you want to make sure that you bring enough clothes. You can always take them off, uh, gloves, you know, a hat with a, a, a jacket with a hood, uh, a rain suit if need be. Um, and then, you know, you're going to need a gun, you're going to need some ammo, and you're going to need your license, and everything else is really up to us. We uh, pack a lunch when we go duck hunting, so we cook breakfast out in the duck blind and lunch out in the duck blind. And on Real Foot Lake, you can't hunt past 3 p.m., so when we go on a duck hunt, we pack in the mornings for everything we need for the day. So you and your friends would get in the boat, and we've already got our food. We go out, and we're basically uh, cooking and hunting and spending the day outside. I've seen the chart of uh, migratory birds and what you can hunt and when and how many you can get. I mean, it seems pretty confusing to me um, when a bird is flying across in front of me. You know, I'm not sure I would know whether or not I could shoot it or not. How, that's how why, do you that's why you need a guide. <laughs> so, so talk I'll, a little I'll bit about I'll that. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what it is and. Um, a lot of guys that are new to duck hunting really like to learn how to blow a duck collar. Um, and, and, and the guys that want to know how to do it again, if they just let us know on the front end, we'll work with anybody to make them a better waterfowl hunter. Hey, a lot of people that hunt with us have their own places they hunt. Uh, 
A lot of guys that hunt with us, I'm not the only outfitter that they hunt with. So a lot of, uh, I've got guys that hunt up in Northern Missouri and, and, and own up in the Dakotas. And I've got guys, the people that come here from Texas that hunt, you know, in Arkansas on the way to Real Foot Lake. So we've got, you know, new people hunt with us all the time, but we've got a lot of regular folks that love to waterfowl hunt and they walk. This is just one of the stops they make during the winter. And it would seem that Real Foot Lake is very different than a lot of other places. So it would be difficult to do it without a guide, mm -hmm. um, even if you are, you know, an expert hunter. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, I notice you are, um, I don't want to call you an expert because you'll say I'm not an expert, but you clearly know what you're doing when it comes to marketing and promotions and PR and um, creating a brand um, around um, Ben Parker. So wh where does, does that come from your uh, days at the University of Memphis? No, it actually comes from when I, when I, after being a broker for a few years and learning more about sales, when you make a decision to be self-employed, you are selling yourself no matter what job you have. Mm -hmm. So from when I got into the bass fishing world and learned how advertisements worked and, and why would a company pay you to, put a sticker on your truck or on your boat, you know, what was, what do you have to do in exchange for that? And it was real cumbersome and it seemed like everybody wanted you to do it for a discount instead of paying you to promote. And so I decided, well, if I'm going to work as hard as I want to work, then I bet I'll be better off promoting my own business. So that was just the route I chose. So I started Parker's Outfitting and it's growing. I mean, we don't just do duck hunts. We do a lot of things. So when people come here, um, my Lakeside Lodge now is set up to where, I mean, we just did a small wedding two weekends ago here at my Lakeside Lodge and it was wonderful. Um, it's not a large venue, but if you've got a group of folks that, you know, 20, 30 folks and want to have a, a, a deck out back and a pier where you could, you know, have a dinner catered um, and have, uh, if you want to do a, a real foot lake boat tour in the evening, we do boat tours, eagle tours. Uh, I can line you up with fishing guides. So over the last 10 years, my job, I still guide one group of people duck hunting every day, but I have more guides that work for me that are taking out other folks. Um, I own two houses and I'm leasing three more houses at the lake this winter. So we're running five groups of people a day during duck season. But when duck season's over in February, you know, we gear up for a fishing season and I've got people that will take my customers fishing or bow fishing at night, which is another fun thing. Um, we have groups that come here and, you know, the guys want to do one thing and, and the girls want to do another thing. But I always make a point that they need to stop in Union City and go to the Discovery Park because if you're going to spend a three-day weekend in Northwest Tennessee, you're silly if you don't go see two things and that's the discovery park of America and that's real foot Lake. Amen, brother. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> um, who shoots, um, who shoots all your video and who posts all of your content? Do you do that yourself? I have for the last several years until recently. And uh, I've got a friend of mine and I might not want to give his name up because I, I want to keep him to myself. <laughs> but uh, he, he's, he does a great job and he's, I, I got, I worked out a deal and actually it's been a major stress reliever for me because I'm trying to be a guide and I'm trying to be an outfitter and, and building trips in a sense for folks if they want to come here and have a dinner catered one night and go on a boat trip or they want to go on a fishing trip, you know, you can, there are things to do here again, without having to hunt or fish. Um, it's not all about hunting and fishing. So um, when, when people come here, it's, I don't know, building, building what they want. But I got a friend of mine that is a real good uh, videographer with uh, EMP, which is a company out of Paducah. It's part of the Higdon Outdoors group. Uh, over the last few years, I've hired them to do quite a bit of work for me. Uh, but right now I've got, you know, a guy that is just starting to 
you know, do a deal where they come to, he comes down and spends one day a month with me and we, whatever we're doing that day, we get some content and he keeps it more on track where we can post at least, you know, three things uh, a week that it's a little higher quality and stuff that I just, I've got so many hats on. I can't, you know, document what I'm doing because I'm doing so much stuff. And so that's really helped me because I've got a lot of customers that want to know what we're doing all the time. And um, I like hearing from my customers and uh, we communicate all, all the time, all year round about duck season. So it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah. The, the, um, the content was really, not only was it uh, well done and professional, but it was also interesting to me as somebody who's not even, you know, in that culture of, of duck hunting, I, I was thinking, Hey, this would make a good reality show. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, actually, Sandburg, Tennessee could be a reality show, but, <laughs> uh, but it that, really that, could. It really could. It really could. I hate to say it, though, no, but um, it's, yeah, it, I mean, it could be. You know, it's that, um, you know, the uh, Duck Commanders uh, made that Duck Dynasty famous, you know, and it, that's from a small little town of duck hunters. And, and what people don't realize is that there are a lot of little towns around the South. And even north of here that have their own little communities that that love to uh, and people that love to duck hunt and and northwest Tennessee, there are a lot of duck hunters around here. Um, a lot of people that really enjoy doing it. Is that um, hotel still for sale there in Sandburg? It is. See, that would be the perfect place for somebody who wanted to invest in a little hotel in a small town where people are duck hunting with a little cafe and a, and a bait and tackle shop. It, it, it could it could be, but I tell you what, it, I, I really do have a vision for this town. But it's it's not. Yes, you could buy that, but what really needs to happen is it. It's a lot of it needs to get bought, and a lot of money needs to come here to completely redevelop around this lake because it could be so much more. Not just the you know people come here for the state parks and they're great, but there's a lot of commercial property that is I believe very undervalued around here that could could potentially be something. I mean, it could be like the little Gatlinburg of you know like West Tennessee, uh, and and flow right along with Discovery Park of America. I'm just one of the guys that are here locally that I'm trying to make things better here where I live, and I'm trying to. Uh, provide some opportunities for local employment. And I want people to come see my lake. This is where I live. This is where I'm from. It's a beautiful place. It's one thing to see it from the shoreline. It's another thing to actually see it out on the lake. So I want to invite you to come down this uh, anytime, actually, you want to go. But even if you want to go, uh, uh, if you want to bundle up, we can go now. But if you want to go next spring when when it starts warming up, let me give you a boat tour of Real Foot Lake and let's get some um, a videographer and film it and and uh, show people uh, kind of what we do out on the lake. I'd love to show you that. Yeah, that's a great idea. That would be fun and we could use it as content on both our sites yeah. um, to let people know more about what you can find when you um, <clears throat> come to this area. Along that same vein, something we've kind of been toying around with and thinking about is an exhibit at Discovery Park on waterfowl. Um, yeah. Do you think there are things that the general public doesn't know about waterfowl that would make an interesting exhibit? Uh, I would, I would focus a lot on the migration and where different birds start and where they stop and how many of those coincide here across, you know, this, uh, this part of the, the flyway. You've got um, small geese that come from the tundra. You've got, um, an American coot that is, uh, if not the highest, that they migrate at a higher altitude than any other waterfowl, from what I understand. There's there's a lot of cool statistics about the birds and where they come from and how they migrate and when they migrate that I think would be really interesting um, to break down. I might be able to help with some of that if if you need help. Yeah, no, that we definitely, the way we do exhibits is we do focus groups with all kinds of people that are stakeholders on the topic, like the ag exhibit that we're opening. So yeah. uh, getting your help would be crucial. Um, 
the other thing that I think a lot of people maybe don't understand is how duck hunting and or waterfowl hunting and conservation kind of go hand in hand. Um, can you touch a little bit on uh, the issue of uh, conservation? I can. And let me tell you a little short story. When I was in uh, college uh, as a freshman, now I, I grew up around here. I did not grow up living in the city. It was as foreign to me as I, I mean, just completely foreign because I went from small town USA to University of Memphis living on campus. And I took this English class and um, the teacher, you could um, not to be stereotypical, but you could tell the teacher probably wasn't a fan of hunting. Uh, let's just leave it like that. And it, it was a, a female teacher. She was an awesome teacher, uh, but you, you could tell that she was not accustomed to the outdoors at all. And we had to write this paper or this bit uh, essay or whatever. They went an essay. It was a big, I can't remember what they called it, uh, a research paper of some type that actually we worked on it the entire semester. And I did mine on conservation and, and whitetail deer management and come at it from the perspective of if you don't hunt these animals, they overpopulate, they disease, and that disease can spread to other animals, and it's important to keep them regulated. An insurance company will tell you that, hey, we've had too many claims in this part of Tennessee. You know, they'll lobby for, for, uh, for deer seasons, for example, uh, because there's so many accidents. Um, there are a lot of ways that you can use uh, deer meat uh, to, for people that are needy, that, that need food and food banks and things of that nature. So there's a lot of things that come from waterfowl hunting uh, that are similar to that same uh, scenario with, with deer. Um, there, there's reasons why they have limits on how many birds you can take a day. And there's reasons why they have the length of seasons is to uh, keep track of the, the waterfowl population. And if a birds uh, aren't doing well, then, you know, we might not be able to hunt them one season. Um, if they're doing excellent with, you know, we might could be a little more liberal with the birds that we can take in a day. But right now it's been pretty a standard thing at real foot lake and really in the united states where you can shoot uh, where you can harvest four mallards a day per person um, and you can also have a couple of bonus ducks on top of that so six a six bird limit waterfowl hunting around here is what we go by um and then um are you you probably work with ducks unlimited um i know that name comes up a lot in the world of waterfowl um mm -hmm. what what exactly is ducks unlimited ducks unlimited is a company that um i believe started in memphis i know they have some headquarters down in memphis that uh over the years they've raised money through uh individual ducks unlimited chapters all over the country really and raising money and buying property uh that is just manage for wildlife habitat and a lot of that is north of here a lot of it's in canada hmm. but it just creates uh refuges and places that you know the birds have a great place to uh raise their little ones the following year and and, and the cycle continues well so i have no doubt that we have inspired n numerous people who are hunters and not hunters to want to come to this area and and uh visit you out on real foot lake and stop by discovery park how can people track you down um online parkersoutfitting.com uh, is my website and if you have any questions about anything you can reach me through there or you can follow me on instagram at parkers outfitting um Either of those two ways would be the best way to get in touch. You're on Facebook too. On Facebook as well. Yeah, I love, I I've um, followed you today. So uh, thank well, you so much for uh, yeah. spending a few minutes with us. This was really interesting and you've answered some questions that I've wondered for a while. Awesome. Well, <laughs> I'm going to put my clothes back on and go back out on this lake. It's kind of, just now that I got warmed up, I was freezing and now I'm warm. I got to go back on the lake. We have a two day early duck season this weekend. So, we have a lot of folks coming uh, to hunt with us. Uh, they're going to come in Friday night, hunt Saturday and Sunday. Then the season ends, and then we've got um, a short break until the season starts back on December the 5th, and that runs through January the 31st. 
I would invite you to call me if you'd like to go on a duck hunt, but we are at full capacity. We can't take anyone else. So uh, if you're interested in going on a duck hunt with us, the best thing to do is try to get in touch with me in March or April of next year. That's when I'll start booking for the following year during waterfowl season. Sounds good. Full capacity is uh, uh, two lovely words. That's right. That's right. (laughs) Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Start planning your visit to Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.